welcome learners. We're on page 63, seven times nine. Uh, and we're gonna look at forms of poetry and concentrate mostly on narrative poem here. But let's look at these two different forms of poetry. Two major forms of poetry are lyric poetry and narrative poetry. Understanding a poem's structure and style will help you to analyze the meaning of a poem. So when you're looking at a poem, if you can get structure and style, it's going to help with an analysis. In other words, understanding structure and style will help you to break a poem down. It will help you to analyze the meaning of the poem and to identify the theme or the insight about life that it conveys. Another word for conveys are communicates. Let's skip the narrative poem. A narrative poem tells a story and includes the main elements of a short story. Characters, setting, conflict, and plot. Conflict and plot, I'd like to put a little rectangle around and an arrow up. And then I'd like you to put a little heart like it's in the side of a tree and you can write C plus P. Conflict plus plot. You can't have one without the other. Conflict drives the story. Conflict drives narratives. No conflict, no story. A narrative poem may also include musical effects, but generally not to the same degree that a lyric poem does. Okay, so let's take a look at just the conflicts, just the conflicts in a narrative poem, okay? So when we're looking for conflicts, we're looking for two different types, okay? We're gonna be looking at the main conflict. A lot of people call that the central conflict. Central conflict. And then sub, the root meaning under conflict. Conflicts that might be wrapped up in the central conflict, most likely they are, but are small conflicts unto themselves. So we're going to take a fine tooth comb through uh, this narrative poem on page 59 called Translating Grammar. So let's take a look at this poem and see what conflicts we can find or not find. According to my sketch, rows of lemon and mango, trees frame the courtyard of grandfather stone and clapboard home. The shadow of a palomino gallops on the lip of the horizon. I don't see any, any conflicts. If we were to stop there, it would be a conflict-free poem so far as I can tell. Let's see where the conflict might come in. The teacher says, the house is from some Zorro movie I've seen. Well, now we've got a conflict, right? It is grandfather's, it's a family house that he's remembering, and it's been accused of Zorro, who is a TV character. So we've got two different, um, we've got the truthful opinion, or the truth, what is truthful, versus what the teacher is saying. And the teacher seems to be making an assumption So we've got a conflict here. And we know that a conflict will drive narrative. Right? So here in the second stanza, we've got our first conflict. Conflict. And let's see, it looks like the conflict is deepened here. Ask my mom, I protest. This verb, protest, certainly a, a verb about conflict. She was born there, right there on the second floor. 
So not only our, our sub-conflict that we, that we have now is um, his mother's word. Another sub-conflict is his grandfather's reality is called into question, right? So student versus teacher, teacher versus mother, teacher versus grandfather's reality, teacher versus memory. Hmm. Crossing her arms, she moves on. Hmm. Seems pretty dismissive. So another sub-conflict is that this teacher, who is frankly a jerk, is dismissive. Memories, once certain as rivets, become confused. So we have another conflict, and that is confused memories. In strange places, and I questioned the house, the horse, the wrens perched on the slate roof. Right, so this is the substance of that conflict. The roof Oscar Hartin tumbled from one hot Tuesday. Falling off the roof, I can say this is someone who's fallen off a ladder from some height before, is definitely a conflict, but here it's a sub-conflict. This isn't a poem that's just about Oscar Hartin. We don't get to Oscar Hartin until we're on line 23 of the poem. So this is a sub-conflict. What's this sub-conflict doing? Hmm. Installing a new weather vane, he broke his shin in two fingers. Well, broken shin hurts, that's a sub-conflict, and the two fingers. Classmates finish the drawings of New York City. Housing projects on Navy Street. I draw one too, with wild grass rising from sidewalk cracks. Well, if that's happening, right? That is a sub-conflict. It's blight, right? When things aren't taken care of as they ought to. Like windows in big round letters, I title it Grandfather's House. Beaming, the teacher scrawls an A+. So it looks to me like the bad guy won. So not only do we have our main conflict, but it's resolved here. And who won? The teacher won, the jerk assumption-making, stereotyping teacher, one. In the corner, and taste it to the green blackboard. To the green blackboard. And we get some a little bit of repetition here. So this might be that little bit of lyric or musical quality, right? But we have our, the teacher one. So part of me thinks, well, the main conflict here is between the student's reality versus the teacher's assumptions. That's our central conflict. But look at all of the different small conflicts it implicates. His mother's word, grandfather's reality, his memory. Um, so the central conflict here could be memory versus assumptions. in all the different ways that assumptions can shape the world. Central conflict, right? If you have a plot diagram, central conflict goes right there. And it drives all the other little sub-conflicts along the way, is resolved when the teacher wins, and then the close, uh, closing action or the resolution um, is puts an A-plus on it, puts it on the blackboard.